I wish you God's blessings as I welcome you to yet another episode of Living a Mouse, a serialized program on the Holy Eucharist presented by Verbum TV. Living a Mouse, uh, as uh, the theme suggests, focuses on enabling our Catholic faithful to better understand the Holy Eucharist. And we have as the example of the two disciples on their way to Emmaus, where our Lord enlightened them on the Holy Scriptures and they recognized the risen Lord in the breaking of bread. Dear friends, in the last episode, we were talking about the Word of God and the homily and we came up to the prayers of the faithful. And we did that with a very erudite liturgist who is our resource person. And I'm glad once again to welcome Reverend Father Cecil Joy Pereira, currently the director of the Daham Seven Seminary Kalutara and the former uh, director of sacred liturgy of the Archdiocese of Colombo. Welcome to Living Emmaus, Father Cecil Joy. Thank you very much, Trevor. Yes, and uh, dear viewers, so as I just reminded you, we have more or less concluded the section on the word of God with the prayers of the faithful, but I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm going to tell you that, you know, it's not finished. There's a lot more that you need to understand about that section of the liturgy of the word. And that is what we are going to discuss today. So Father, I'd like to take you to the point of, you know, the liturgy of the word. I mean, the liturgy itself, there are, there are so many liturgical books that we use in the mass. Can you just talk about some of these books? Uh, what, what, do they, uh, what is the significance of those books and what do they contain each of these books? Maybe we could uh, start with a little bit of history, you know, because right. uh, this is a subject which is not very familiar to our faithful. That's why I ask you that question. Yes, yes, yes. and they always see us turning pages. Right. <laughs> and then uh, when we get stuck with pages, people notice that something is wrong, <laughs> but they really don't know what is wrong. What is wrong, <laughs> right. Right. So it's uh, actually... Uh, very useful for everyone to know a little bit of the history of the liturgical books mm -hmm. and uh, the present situation, what we are using now. In fact, uh, when uh, we study liturgy for, let's say, for a licensure that's a master's degree or uh, even for doctoral research, there is a specific subject taught for six months, oh really? For six months, called uh, Libri Liturgici, that is uh, liturgical books. Okay. So you can imagine. Six months. <laughs> yes, that's a six-month course. Right. Right. You can imagine how complex that must be. Yes, a, a very brief, a very sketchy overview of the historical development. Yeah. Now we know immediately after the resurrection of the Lord. Obviously, they didn't have books printed or written uh, for use. Yeah. But they had the Hebrew Bible. Hmm. They had the Hebrew Bible. And then uh, from uh, some of the scripture texts in the New Testament, we realize they also started uh, using or reading the testimonies of the, the apostles very probably sketchy writings or unwritten mm -hmm. that they were continuing with the oral tradition. Right. The first uh, evidence of something being read out is found in Justin Martyr mm -hmm. around the year 150 AD. So that's very early. He has a very beautiful uh, record of the Eucharist uh, as it was celebrated in the second century. And he says, when the people gathered on Sunday, the scriptures or the memoirs of the apostles, that's how mm -hmm. he's, it is said, were read as long as time permitted. Right. So there must have been some source from which mm -hmm. they read. The source is not specified there, but we are sure that they had some source. Memoirs of the Apostles, that means the writings of the Apostles. Okay. Already by 150, they had the Gospels, they had the Epistles, 
So, mm. they were reading already. Then uh, a very clear evidence, historical evidence comes also in the third century in a uh, writing called the Apostolic Tradition of Hippolytus. Okay. It's also called the Egyptian Church Order. Mm -hmm. There we have the Eucharistic prayers. There okay. we have ordination rites. Whether it was a book prescribed for the whole of the church, well, we are not sure because it was uh, not yet the time of freedom. Mm -hmm. Not yet after 313. Yeah. This is uh, in the early early third century. But we had that. Now today we can read the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus. So that's the time of the persecution. Yes, certainly. And and uh, now we go back to the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus. Uh, for example, we find uh, the second Eucharistic prayer more or less like uh, the U second Eucharistic prayer we use today. Oh, really? Yes, yeah, so, so it's uh, very, very... Perhaps it has been used as a source or something sub subsequently? Certainly, certainly, yeah. certainly, certainly it was a source. Yeah. So, uh, to make a long story, story short, that's how we began our writings, mm. right? And then uh, by the end of the third century, definitely we had some writings because people like St. Ambrose of Milan, they refer to these uh, books, mm -hmm. liturgical books. Then by the uh, ninth century, we definitely had uh, things like uh, the Ordinis Romani, that means how things must be organized. And uh, some of the missals, the sacramentaries began to appear. If I may because, ask you, Father, yes. now, the earliest writings that you were talking about, even of Hippolytus and so on, what language were they in? Originally, Origin Greek. Originally Greek. Because Greek. It wouldn't have been Latin by then. No, not yet. No, yes. Latin yeah, came was. actually gradually Latin from Greek to Latin. It was a gradual transition, transition. Yeah. right? Gradual mm -hmm. transition which began during the time of Pope Damasus the first, okay. right? Then slowly it began. Then mm. during the time of Pope Gregory the first, things became very stable with regard to liturgical books. Mm. So. Uh, they started, uh, you know, things called the libelli, that means uh, small writings put together. And then there were sacramentaries appearing, like the Verona sacramentary, the Gelasian sacramentary, the Gregorian sacramentary. So you see, it's a gradual development. Mm -hmm. And to go to another milestone, it would be the, the, the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. You know the Council of Trent, which began in 1545 and went up to 1563, yeah. a long uh, period of time. And uh, the Council of Trent uh, decreed that these books be revised. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a very good uh, place to begin with if you want a kind of a recent history, right. not go back as far as, let's say, the 2nd century, 3rd century. Uh, the names could be uh, rather unfamiliar. But mm -hmm. the Council of Trent is very much known because it came with the, with the protest, let's say, so to say, of uh, Martin Luther and others mm -hmm. against the Catholic, uh, some other doctrines. So at the end of the Council of Trent, in 1588, uh, the Congregation for Rights was established mm -hmm. and it was commissioned to also come up with liturgical books. A unified? Yes, probably for, the unified, for the whole for church. For the whole church. Yeah. And as a result, in 1568, the Rituale Romano, that is the Roman ritual, appeared. And in 1570, during the time of Pope Pius V, the Missal appeared. Right. 1570, the Latin Missal, mm -hmm. which was used uh, universally in the Catholic Church, right? No other book, the Roman Missal appeared. And for 400 years, without any change, up to 1970, that mm -hmm. is the mass book we were using. Yeah. And then came, of course, the Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. The Vatican Council in 1963, and then... Uh, Vatican Council itself prescribed some revisions. So we are now having the revised liturgical books in the post-Vatican II era. Yeah. We are there. Now, what are these books? We need to at least understand and identify 
ideally we must be able to identify any lay person especially lay pe people who are uh, closely connected to liturgical ministries like yeah. the lectors must mm -hmm. be they must be able to easily identify which book is which which one right. now first we have the missal and of course the sacri sacristan sacristan <laughs> the sacristan of course uh, First, we have the missal. You have seen yeah. the very often the missal that we are using now is a very big one, bulky yeah. one, mm. actually practically causing a few <laughs> few difficulties also, and the pages can get easily torn because it's so so yeah. heavy. Uh, that is the missal. Uh, earlier, we used to have the sacramentary. Now, mm. uh, one important thing is to know the difference between a sacramentary, sacramentary. and a missal. Mm -hmm. Sacramentary is more restricted, mm -hmm. right? In the sense, it had uh, uh, re it had only those parts for the priest, but the missal can also include even readings for All others. Right. If you take a daily missal or mm. a Sunday missal, you will see different editions, different versions. You have also the readings included mm. into that, yeah. right? But of course, the missile that we use in churches, they won't have the readings because the readings have been separated and put in another book. Yeah. But then the missile is comprehensive. Sacramentary mm. is more restricted. Sacramentary actually presumed a bishop as the celebrant. Mm -hmm. Right. And also had uh, additional other rites other mm. than the mass. Like sacramental rites. Uh, yes. Yeah. Even, even yeah, ordination rites. Yeah. Even ordination yeah. rites were there. But it's so not in the missile. No, not in the missal. Missal has the prayers for all those, but not those readings and other parts. Right. right? So, so uh, missal is more, uh, sorry, missal can be more comprehensive, sacramentary is more restricted. But nowadays we don't use that sacramentary mm -hmm. as such. We use the missal. missal. So the first thing, first book you must know about the liturgical books is the missal. Right. The word itself is uh, clear. Missa coming from uh, the word Missa. Missa is Mass, so the Mass book. Mass book. To be and it's, very uh, usually placed on the altar. Yes, exactly. That's it is, the place it is where you all find it. normally placed on the altar, but should not be ideally placed on the altar from the beginning of the Mass. Yeah. Uh, we will come to that. You know, mm. there are movements within the Mass. I think we we must also talk about those movements and like the from, presidential prayer. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm. So. Ideally, not placed uh, on the altar from the beginning. Right. Right. But so we have uh, we have so the missal. Then we have the lectionary. Right. The lectionary, right. and uh, that is the handbook of the lectors. Clear, clearly, the, I mean, mainly connected with the liturgy of the word. Liturgy of the word, and right. should be known by every lector. Exactly. Backwards. Exactly. They must know the lectionary thoroughly. The lectionary, we will talk about it today. Yeah. It's a little bit uh, of a complex uh, kind of a composition, compilation, the way it is uh, compiled. But we have to understand. We will explain that. Yeah. But the lectionary contains basically the readings for mass. Readings for mass. Right. Masses, not only of Sundays, not only of weekdays, but also other masses. Solemnities and solemnities uh, and feast even of saints. yes, feast of the saints, uh -huh. even for the celebration of the sacraments, right? There are also uh, votive masses, mm. so many. All readings are there. When you say votive masses, you're referring to special occasions and so on. Votive masses are those like you know these devotional ones like the. Uh, precious uh, blood of Jesus, the holy name of Jesus. All right. These are votive, votive masses. masses yeah. All that is there. All that is all that is found in the lection. The readings. Many of our lectionaries also have the gospel included. Yeah. Right. That is for the sake of convenience. But actually, good lectionaries don't have the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now that's where we come to the the other book, important book. Here we have, I have brought this book today because some people are still not very familiar with this. Now, if you see, uh, this is the book of Gospels, right? And uh, it is uh, kind of a very uh, beautifully decorated book. Yeah, it looks Actually, this is a simpler version. Mm -hmm. 
there are books of gospels which are very uh, beautifully decorated mm -hmm. because this contains only the gospel texts right right if you see now even the the, the cover here is uh, the cover carries the symbols of the four evangelists yes right and then christ in the middle the yeah. symbol of christ alpha and the omega alpha and the omega mm. in the middle and uh, for a long time many of our churches were very unfamiliar with this in fact mm. i remember not uh, too far back in our history here in the local church when we uh, did this uh, book of gospels in singhala people were confused right. they were asking what is this book now mm -hmm. Haven't we got enough books that we are introducing yet another <laughs> one into our racks? And a larger one. And that. a larger one, or a bulky and a heavy one yeah. at that. No, the book of Gospels is very special, unique. Each parish church must have a separate, their own copy. Mm -hmm. In their right. own language. In their use. own language. It is available. It's available. It's available the Singhala version Singhala. is also available for Yes, yes. Singhala? Yes, we did. I, mm. I edited the... A singhala version. version. Okay. Right, that's long ago. And then mm. we have we have gone into second, third print also print. because it's in demand now. Mm -hmm. Now people understand. Yeah. Right. And that's the book that must be carried in the the entrance procession. Yeah. Not any other book. We mm -hmm. told that very clearly. Not the Bible, certainly not the Bible. Right, we used to carry the Bible aloft, no, right in front. No, that's wrong. For a Bible service, it's okay. Yeah, for a Bible <laughs> not service, for the not mass. for the mass, not yeah. for the mass. And we gave all the reasons, hmm. right? And uh, this is the book that is carried uh, very uh, reverently uh, during the gospel procession. Right. And this is the book from which the gospel must be proclaimed. Not from any other book. Mm -hmm. Actually, proclaiming the gospel, gospel from the lectionary, is not the proper thing to do. Although we maybe we may tolerate that during weekdays, yeah. But at least on Sundays, mm. the the book of gospels must be very reverently carried in the entrance procession, placed on the altar, yeah. And from the altar during the singing of the acclamation must be a very majestic triumphant singing of uh, uh, the gospel acclamation the book must be very reverently carried to the ambo right. a small procession within the sanctuary but an important mm. one okay. right then trevor there are other books now we spoke about the missal and the sacramentary yes. the lectionary the book of the gospels. gospels another important book is the ordo yes yes the ordo. now it's in all sacristies of the churches, you know, you must have that. That is where we have the guidelines, the readings and the, the, the liturgical colors, the type of feast or the memorial we have, mm -hmm. then the week in which we celebrate, right, whether it is 18th, 19th, 20th, whether it is here A, B, C, all that mm -hmm. is given, all the instructions are given. In this small uh, book called the Ordo, actually, the history goes back uh, to, let's say, about at least to the 6th, 7th, 8th centuries. Oh, really? When they have this Ordinus Romani, they had more than 50 different uh, versions. Ordinus Romani 1, 2, 3, 4. Hmm. It is from that we get the, actually, the simplified version now. Yeah. Where they had all... Uh, rubrics instructions so meticulously laid out mm -hmm. so they went through and then they knew what to do how to do mm -hmm. so we have a universal ordo every year uh, very early before the beginning of advent we can get it from uh, the congregation for rites in rome right and then based on that each local church prepares its own uh, uh, ordo mm -hmm. for the local church, right. including the local solemnities. For uh, for example, for us, uh, Our Lady of Lanka, yeah. right? Then uh, that of Saint Joseph was. Mm -hmm. Those things we include and prepare our local version. So what happens is, the whole of the Catholic Church will be practically celebrating the same liturgy in the same manner, right. because of these uh, instructions which are very clearly laid out. In Sri Lanka, it is done by the, the National, National Liturgical Commission. Commission. 
under the, the National Liturgical Commission. Under the Bishop's Conference. Under the Bishop's Conference. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, where we prepare the, the Ordo for the local church. Okay. But that is definitely based on the universal Ordo. Okay. We cannot say, okay, you, you do what you want, mm -hmm. we do what we want. But we are allowed under the direction and the guidance and the permission of the local uh, bishops' conference to include the local solemnities. Yes. That is fine. That is okay. I was also referred to one or two other books like the Kiriale. Now, these are Latin words, but we, we don't need to get... Uh, you know, frightened of these words, Kiriale. We don't see them in our churches today, is it? No, not no, very. no, not not very often. Mm -hmm. Very rarely you mm -hmm. would see that. Very rarely. I think, I think, I think it is time that we start introducing them into our uh, choristers, choirs, right. cantors. Kiriale is the book of chants, which carried all the proper chants for the mass, like the Kyrie, Gloria, mm -hmm. Credo. Sanctus, Agnus Dei, mm -hmm. that is, uh, Lord have mercy. Then you have the Gloria. Then you have the Creed, Holy, Holy, mm -hmm. Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. These are chants proper to the Mass. But they are probably in Latin, is it right? They are Latin, but then we have now other versions. You can also, you can also have your own version, provided right. it is endorsed by the local bishops' conference, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Actually, that is Kiriale. Then we have also Graduale. Mm -hmm. Graduale is another book of chants where you have other chants like the entrance antiphon, maybe the communion antiphon, yeah. then the acclamations, uh, then uh, this, uh, this gradual, right? Uh, all those other chants, little, little chants are found there. All right. right? So we have the Kiriale, Graduale. Then we have other books, other books called the antiphonary, antiphonale, antiphonary. Okay. giving us all the antiphons, especially mm -hmm. of the responsorial psalm. Right. So that means there are many liturgical books that can be uh, introduced within the liturgy. Now, the obvious question is, Father, why complicate? Why can't you put all this in one book? Oh, yeah. Why should you have so many books? books? Right, lectionary, then you have the book of Gospels, then you are talking now of Kiriale, then you are talking of Graduale, then you are talking of a Missal, then you are talking of a Sacramentary, sacramentary. then there is another one called the Ceremoniale Episcoporum, that is the ceremonial of the bishops. Why? Why are we so fond of books in the Roman Catholic Church. I was going to ask you, why can't we just, uh, you know, have spontaneous prayers? Is yes, that yes, wait, <laughs> we'll uh, uh, hold on, hold on for a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question. <laughs> but before that, I'll, I'll answer the question I raised myself. Mm. Why so many books? Why, so why many complicate? Books? It's because of the ministries. Right. Each book is meant for a particular liturgical ministry. ministry which we will discuss later this, on. Certainly, yeah. certainly. And that is the beauty of the Roman liturgy. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are a lector, if I am the celebrant, both of us are not going to use the same book. Okay. Right, because your dignity as a lector is respected, hmm. right? is, is acknowledged. Yeah is upheld in high esteem. Mm. So the lector uses the lectionary. Right. The deacon uses the book of gospels. gospels. The cantor uses the kiriale mm -hmm. or the antiphonary or the graduale. Mm. Right. right. See, it's, it's about the, the dignity of the people who minister unto the Lord. All mm -hmm. of us finally go and minister. It's not that all in one idea, right? Now, certainly, why can't I read the first reading? I can jolly well do that. I can also chant the responsorial psalm. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? All in one. But that is uh, not at all good. When we come to serve the Lord, the Lord is served by many ministers. Right. The whole body of Christ 
Hmm. Not one or two people. That's why we are not in favor of people who come and do the first reading, the psalm and the second reading, and the acclamation also. And, and if the possible, the they'll read the gospel also. And the prayers of the faith also. And the prayers of the faith <laughs> also. And when you say, Father, why can't I do that? Yeah. That the, the first reading is so short. Why can't I do the second, second one? See, see, this is rather, rather, you know, childish way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. We look at the ministry, the ministering unto the Lord, right? If you are a lector, read. If you are a cantor, chant, chant. right? That is the idea. So you have your own book. Yeah. It's like a carpenter having his own tools. Hmm. Which it's also, like a, which also is a good thing because they can prepare uh, yes, beforehand. Exactly. You know, instead of coming just to the altar. Exactly. You are surprised with uh, you, what is Can you there. imagine a carpenter coming and borrowing tools from an electrician? No, certainly not. Certainly not. <laughs> and you will see it absurd. You can't do that. No. You must have your own tools because you are, you are a carpenter. And we respect you because you are a carpenter. It's exactly the same logic here. Mm. Right? So, the lector is actually a kind of a you know, technical officer. Yeah. We must understand. And I must do that well, and I must do that, that, and only that. Yeah. That is how the Vatican uh, Council guides us in Numbers 28 and 29 of Sacrosanctum Concilium. It says, the, the, the ministers must perform their duty, only duty, and to the full, hmm. and not do other things. Hmm. Unfortunately, in many of our parishes, it doesn't happen. A few people will read the first reading and then he will step aside and somebody will come and maybe chant or he or she will <laughs> chant that also the second reading yeah. and the acclamation and then the person goes away. Yeah. Very nicely done, of course, very competent people mm -hmm. we have. They, they, they read out and chant very well, but that is not the idea. Yeah. And that is why we have separate books, books. for separate ministries. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we understand the, the, the one who sings the responsorial psalm must have actually the antiphonary with the responses. Mm -hmm. But we don't have, we actually chant those from uh, the, the lectionary. lectionary. Yeah. At least we must understand that there is the possibility having that book. Mm -hmm. So not that we are fond of books, but we are fond of ministering unto the Almighty God yeah. in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. And each minister is dignified in the role he or she plays. Right. This is the whole idea. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine I have one big book and I say, all right, uh, Trevor, come and you read from the same book. And then you pass it on to somebody, please, uh, now you chant. And then you pass on to the other, the, the, the prayers of the faithful, everything inside. So what is happening? Are we really doing something dignified? No, we mm -hmm. are not. We are not. That is why the church has a reason to, a reason to actually encourage people to have all these books. Yeah. And a sacristy must have all these books nicely, very cleanly mm -hmm. stored, so that people, the, the, the ministers can have ready access to those. That's the idea. Yeah. Now coming to your question, if you can... Uh, Kindly raise that question once again. You yeah, asked about so the books. All these books are, are contain prayers that are designated for each Sunday or whatever or the occasion. Uh, why is it uh, not possible for a priest celebrant to improvise his own prayers, say a spontaneous prayer? You know, maybe moved by the Holy Spirit and you know uh, say the prayer. It happens. It happens. <laughs> it happens, yes. but it is not the proper thing. Right. Then you begin to wonder. Is this priest so limited and uh, he's so curtailed by these books? Uh, hasn't he got any, you know, anointing the so-called word mostly <laughs> misused by our people? Yeah. These days, it's that use is uh, hackneyed now. Hmm. Anything and everything is anointed, which we should not use that yeah. word like that. Yeah. Anyway, that's a different, uh, different discussion. Now, we must understand the basic principle of liturgical prayer. Mm -hmm. And the basic principle is lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. Lex orandi, lex means law. Credendi means what we believe. The law of belief is the law of prayer. Yeah. Right. That means in the Catholic Church, in our liturgy, not in uh, you know paraliturgical services, but in the liturgy, 
in the liturgy we pray only what we believe yeah and i cannot pray what i feel now this mm-hmm. important it's it's of utmost importance that our people understand this right now if there are three priests the three priests celebrants are supposed to pray what the church believes as a whole the deposit of faith of the whole church the three priests are not supposed to pray what they feel individually at the moment if they do what happens is what happens is we are not praying the 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 deposit of faith of the church we are each one is individually praying maybe that individually mm. prayer is very sensational yeah very attractive and we like that but we go beyond our liturgy goes beyond feelings and emotions not that we are without feelings and emotions no but it goes beyond it transcends that because the 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 glory that we give to the lord transcends our human nature and see now you are glorified yeah. and in order to glorify you we proclaim what we believe mm-hmm. now what happens when i start improvising supposing i close my eyes right i close the book and close my eyes also Mm-hmm. right then now the holy spirit will guide me is it certainly there can be the guidance of the holy spirit but what do i now say is it what the whole church believes no mm-hmm. no this is the difference then i then i actually yeah. pray something may be very particular and relevant to this community someone present here but not the deposit of faith of the whole church that's why we are very particular about books now for example let's say we have a mass for sick people elderly people and they are all there so i take let's say the day mass now the the temptation and the tendency is to now improvise because this is a very particular congregation yeah okay there is a kind of a very uh, a uh, reasonable you no know, context for us to now change this but what happens is when i try to apply and contextualize over contextualize right it becomes rather private this is for this one yeah. but mass is universal right it's universal glorification of god mm mm-hmm. through the passion death and the resurrection and that's yeah. why we are not in favor of that kind of improvisation, improvisation. Okay. it's very important that our people understand our people go up to the celebrants and say father do something else this is you know very right uh, boring mm. right can't you add some life into this <laughs> well liturgy Uh, in the roman rite is not about you know making something vibrant but it is more of glorification of god that's why if you go to this uh, eastern catholic rites hmm. <clears throat> eastern catholic rites they are not bothered about you know uh, what people feel yeah they are really concerned about how we should glorify god and now i suppose i gave you a kind of yeah, a yeah very clear, answer very to your answer, yes, yes 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 i was just thinking that maybe in a special occasions like that the priest could before the mass talk to the sick people and say okay Certainly. i'm going to offer this mass for you and you know or oh, after, after mass after mass, after mass and, you can have a special yeah. prayer or mm-hmm. something as uh, something uh, and then also we must realize that there are thematic developments of these prayers yeah from sunday to sunday mm-hmm. there are theological oh, right. uh, themes which are underlying these prayers mm-hmm. when we start improvising all the time what happens mm-hmm. is all those things are you, you know removed and disturbed yes so there are there are reasons we mm-hmm. must always understand the catholic church has gone through uh, 2000 years of liturgical history yeah 
and she is wise enough to choose what is best for us. Mm -hmm. If I think that my little brain is uh, better than the wisdom of the church, uh, which is uh, more than 2000 years old, well, uh, that also must be really reflected upon. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I am just a speck in this whole history of salvation. And there have been other you know, wise people before me. And yeah. there will be many more coming after me. Certainly. And my pinch of salt will be very much appreciated. But the church has different principles for this. Yeah. So that's where we need to be more prudent and accommodating. Right, right. So that's regarding the books. Now yes. this one practical question, or I mean, no, I have noticed where it is a, maybe a, a, a bilingual mass, where you have a, one book on the like the lectionary on the on, a, on the ambo in in yes. English, and then uh, the next one is going to be in Sinhala, and then the reader brings it from somewhere from into the ambo. Uh, how practical is that? Yeah, these are practical issues which must be sorted out. The best thing is to have the books already on the ambo, but then there are instances where, let's say, the ambo space is so limited, limited. so so mm. small. Right, and then you cannot place two books there. Hmm. Right, and then uh, the best thing is not to make uh, the ambo a cupboard for books, library awesome. books. Yeah. There are ambos where you have all kinds of books mm -hmm. inside, right, yeah. including maybe sometimes Reader's Digest of the last month. Right, <laughs> so so that cannot be done. The the ambo uh, must have enough space to accommodate at least two books. Right. right, but then when there is no space, mm -hmm. these are practical difficulties. Then we actually tolerate them. Yeah. Yes. Right. So that uh, brings us to the next uh, point that we would uh, discuss, and that is uh, the ministries in the sacred liturgy, which is part of also of the liturgy of the word. Can we exactly. talk about it generally and also particularly with regard to the liturgy of the word, Father? Yes. Sure. Now we must understand that these ministries are not new. Yes. Ministries are not new. Hmm. Already I told you about this uh, apostolic tradition of Hippolytus. Yeah. Can you imagine? There you have the training and the commissioning of the lectors, lectors. mentioned. Hmm. That is in the third century. Right. So if we ever think that these ministries are new things that we are doing, we are wrong, mm -hmm. we are mistaken. Mm -hmm. That means we don't know the history of what we are doing. Deacons, ah, from the very early church, early we had church. deacons. Yeah. The celebrants, we had celebrants. Mm -hmm. We had cantors, we had acolytes. Mm -hmm. So these are not new things, but only thing is, for some time, they got restricted to particular uh, groups, the Vatican II in Sacrosanctum Concilium numbers 28 and 29 opened it out to other lay people. In fact, uh, the lectors couldn't be accommodated uh, uh, after the Council of Trent. Uh, we had only you know, ordained ministers. Okay. And in 1958, Pope Pius XII uh, started bringing in the lay people just for commentaries. Oh, wow. That was a you know, groundbreaking kind of a, hmm. you know, introduction. Uh, then came the Vatican II, which, which encouraged the lay people once again to take, upon, take up uh, the ministries which we had originally in the church. Right. Then in 1972, Pope Paul VI came up with another document called Ministeria Queda, where he encourages lay people to be very committed to these ministries, to be trained, to be commissioned. Yeah. Right Now, what are these ministries? Generally, we have several. If you start with, of course, the ordained ministries, ordained ministers, like the bishop, the celebrant, then we have the, the deacon, right? all those people. And then leaving uh, the ordained ministers aside, we have the lectors. The cantors, now we have the psalmists, yeah. right? Psalmists, uh, he, he, that, that, that category is now recognized very specially. Then we have also uh, the ushers, mm -hmm. ministers, extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. 
then we have also uh, the sacristans the acolytes right. or the altar servers there are many ministries mm. in fact in many local churches even decorators who uh, contribute towards decorating uh, the church yeah. the sanctuary and the main aisle and the side aisles of the church they are also part of this ministry, ministry. now coming to the ministries particular to the liturgy of the word hmm. so we have the celebrant yeah. then we have the deacon yeah then we have the lector yeah. we have the cantors we have the psalmist right okay then we could also have commentators right see within this how many ministries have come hmm. together hmm. and that's why we always say we must appreciate the ministries yeah. the liturgical ministries right now they have different roles to play hmm. actually here in this particular instant the main celebrant the chief celebrant is very inactive mm -hmm. right we call it a non presidential function right ministerial function that means not actually of the uh, presiding celebrant for mm -hmm. example he doesn't do the first reading no he doesn't do the responsorial psalm he doesn't do the second reading hmm. he doesn't do the acclamation he can also delegate the gospel to a deacon or to yeah. a concelebrant mm -hmm. right he can delegate the homily yeah see so now he is seated there mm -hmm. in fact uh, trevor one day somebody asked me father after the offertory only the priest is doing everything no <laughs> so i said uh, for a long time you have been doing everything, everything. no we have also been sitting there <laughs> seated there <laughs> sitting there doing nothing no yeah. i said ah oh, yes no father <laughs> they didn't know they didn't only realize father has been sitting there doing nothing nothing yeah now sitting is not doing nothing yeah right it is my mental spiritual active participation yeah, the presiding role continues yes right? yes continues yeah. then i i uh, i begin the creed i initiate the prayer of the faithful i close mm -hmm. the prayer of the faithful perhaps i could i i may must be the one i could be the one who is preaching so yeah. i am there but not very actively Active. because it's a ministerial function not a presidential function mm -hmm. that is why this ministries must be very clearly distinguished and identified and that's why we must train different people for different ministries i was going to uh, you use the word train i was going to ask you that question well to what now we know that bishops and priests uh, deacons they are trained with the seminary formation and so on uh, how about these ministries is there kind of a form i mean a kind of a regulated training program for these ministries or is just uh, definitely we have we have i have done many uh, seminars live in seminars to train lectors yeah and just because we are good at elocution hmm. maybe we have a gold medal from some uh, english academy for elocution it doesn't mean that you are a perfect lector yeah there is so much to it hmm. in fact uh, i have had a very i had a very uh, interesting experience one uh, in one uh, place where we conducted these sessions one gentleman came and said father i have been reading for the last 25 years what else yeah. do i have to learn now right i said uh, are you very busy he said no no father i am retired hmm. he said can you be patient for the 2 3 days that we have okay father i'll i'll be there i'll be there but i don't think i have anything to learn hmm. now so he was there okay very patiently he was there and mm. i saw him getting more and more interested in what we were doing and saying at the end he came up and he said father please permit me to say a few words mm -hmm. and he said i'm sorry i must confess i thought i knew but i now understand i knew next to nothing <laughs> right <laughs> See, he's been see, humble he's been humble enough yeah, to acknowledge yeah, he, that yeah huh? he 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 was yeah. very humble and he mm. he came up and said because when they came, when they come for these trainings we give them a whole uh, kind of a background knowledge right about the bible about the revelation 
about the books which are inspired, about mm -hmm. the canon uh, mm -hmm. in the Bible, then the history of the lectionary, the history of the liturgy of the word. It's not just that mm -hmm. you are given a book and now you read. Yeah. No. Then uh, different uh, literary forms in the Bible, how to read out different forms in a different manner. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah how to prepare a reading, how to prepare for your reading. There is remote preparation and uh, immediate preparation. Hmm. How to work as a team. Yeah. My God, there's so much to uh, yeah. learn. And then we have practical sessions. Hmm. We get them to read before a microphone and then we uh, video record their readings yeah. and we play it back and then we tell them, okay, see, this is how you are seen by others and then you must also be very critical about your own reading and these are the mistakes. So we have very, very good uh, training, training sessions. sessions. And uh, very often uh, our lectors don't have these opportunities. That's, uh, that's, that's sad. But yes. then whenever possible, they must attend these seminars. Yeah. And then at least they, might, they have to spend two full days. Residential for a, for a, or something. Is yes. It? Or at least, yeah. Residential or, or at least you go otherwise. home and come mm. back. Better residential so that you are yeah, really you know, cut off from the yeah. other, other mm. you know, activities mm. in your daily life mm. and then come and concentrate only on this. But these and kind of uh, programs should be organized by at parish level or deanery level. Yeah, I think, deanery and, level, yeah. parish level. Yeah. They can be organized. Mm. They can be organized. And, and the I resource have, persons are available in the... Uh, yeah, I, I, I have conducted many such seminars. Officer. Many such seminars. And then mm. people are amazed at what they, what they learn hmm. and they become uh, better readers and their lives change, hmm. their you know, uh, way of looking at uh, the readings change, otherwise yeah. they just come and read out something. Yeah. They read out well but they think they have done the best. So hmm. uh, coming back to the ministries, uh, we must understand that they must be carefully selected, trained and commissioned. As much as possible. I know mm. I was also a parish priest in BC and big parishes. So there are practical difficulties at times to find people. Yeah. Now more and more our volunteers are becoming fewer. Mm. Right? Those days we had many people uh, volunteering to read, volunteering to do this, do that. But uh, with these times people are becoming fewer. People who are opting to become ministers. But once we become ministers... We must try to live the spirituality of that ministry. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Then we understand, okay, this is a journey for me. Yeah. This is not just a kind of a, uh, a little bit of help to our parish priest because he's short of people to read. Mm -hmm. Or this is uh, not because, you know, the readers there are not so good. Their English is not so good, so I must go and help. Mm. Right. Not that kind of idea. I must also tell you, the, 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 the role of the, the ministries of the cantors and the Samis are very much misunderstood. Right. At least lectors are better. Mm -hmm. Because we have been talking about lectors. But then when, when you say, okay, our choristers must be specially trained as cantors. What right. do we mean by that? To lead others in singing. singing. Hmm. The role of a cantor. The Psalmist. To lead the responsorial psalm, the chant, hmm. not to read out, but to chant. Yeah. Then the cantors must be able to chant the versicle of the gospel acclamation. Mm -hmm. Very often uh, they, they leave it to the celebrant. celebrants. Mm -hmm. So the Alleluia or the, the, the other acclamation is sung, and the versicle is not sung by the, chanted by the hmm. cantor. No, that's not, the, that's not the job of the, the, the celebrant. The celebrant is there to proclaim the gospel. Yeah. Right? I think I told this also yeah. uh, once before. I don't sing my own welcome song. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's absurd. Yeah. It's uh, actually, you know, kind of a joke. Mm. Right? That's why the cantors must also take their ministry seriously. Yes. We really need to tell our choristers, look here, your duty is not just to sing for the Sunday Mass and then uh, to sing for a wedding or a church feast or a Vespers. You are a special group of people performing a liturgical ministry. This idea of the ministry, especially among our cantors, 
I think mm. is very it's poor. Not, yeah. It's very They're poor. They're not aware of that. They're they not aware of that. Yeah. That we are cantors, that we are Samis, that we are actually performing a ministry. If you ask choristers, no. 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 They yeah. say we are a chorister. I'm a chorister. I'm a chorister. Mm, part of the choir. Right. So uh, Trevor, therefore, we need to really uh, be very clear about liturgical books, liturgical ministries, mm. and the different roles we play, so that we actually make the liturgy of the word more and more meaningful. meaningful. Right. More and more, I would say, uh, a source for the sanctification of the people of God. Right. Uh, I'd like to ask a question, Father, connected with the ministries. And you were talking about, you know, the awareness of that, uh, that you are a minister. Uh, it, it's something that you must be aware of, the dignity of that particular ministry. We also have, you know, specific weapons for them. Yeah, uh, very often garb. it's not being used uh, these days. Yeah. Or yeah. What is your comment garb. on that? Yes. In fact, I introduced this uh, lector's garb. You call garb. it the garb. Le lector's garb. Lector's garb. Or lector's alb. Right. And that is very important because... You are, when you, Trevor, go and read, when you go up to the Ambo, you are not uh, Mr. Trevor Ludewijk. Yeah. You are God's chosen lector for that particular uh, liturgical celebration. And therefore, you are different now. Yeah. You are a minister chosen. Right? And when you put on that garb, you understand that I am different now. Yeah. That's mm. one reason why you... Uh, have that dignity, you feel the dignity of that ministry. Secondly, it also helps us to uh, solve a practical problem of different dresses. Mm. Yeah. Right? Different dresses. But yeah. once you have and the same... And inappropriate dresses inappropriate sometimes. Dresses. Huh? I didn't want to use that <laughs> word. <laughs> but we must uh, say the uh, yes. truth. Yes, some people are not... Properly, properly dressed, dressed, yeah. dressed so. decently dressed sometimes, yeah. especially when we have these wedding masses. Mm. We really have an issue at hand, yeah. right? Uh, sometimes uh, it can be very embarrassing, very embarrassing the way they come up to the ambo to read. You don't know whether they have come up to read as a prophet or whether they are going for a bath. <laughs> so it's, it's sometimes so embarrassing. It would be good to suggest that just as they, you know, prepare a special, you know, bridal dress and a, you know for the maids and so on, another special dress can be also prepared by them for the lector who is coming for that wedding yeah, mass but then and they, make it a nice they one. Are supposed to, they are supposed to have the liturgical vesture. Yeah. They're supposed to have. Mm. So that everyone looks equal. Equal. Yeah. Right. And mm. also there is also this uh, problem of discrimination. Sometimes people come yeah. very beautifully dressed, very elegantly dressed, yeah. very richly dressed. And there right. can be the next lecture, you know, uh, obviously not so richly dressed. Yeah. Yeah. And then once you have the liturgical garb, that's it's a leveler. That's level. a good leveler, I think. Right. Right. Okay, thank you, Father. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's all the time we have. And uh, dear viewers, uh, that brings us to the end of today's uh, episode on the Living a Mouse. Uh, we thank Father Cecil Joy for giving us those very useful insights into uh, today's discussion and look forward to much more understanding of the Holy Eucharist so that when we celebrate the Eucharist, we will have our hearts burning, a living a Mouse indeed. God bless you. Thank you.